Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the next uh, section of country reports. It's going to be three in this one. I hope um, your discussions online were as inspiring and fruitful as ours uh, in here that are to be continued. But now uh, first to some more input. We are um, starting getting the first uh, input from Ukraine, from Elisa Olinik. She's a PhD student at the Doctoral College at Mozarteum University and University of Salzburg. She has studied uh, journalism and theater studies, both in Ukraine and Germany, and worked as a journalist for Ukrainian media outlets in the nonprofit sector. She has furthermore been a directing assistant to directors at several um, German theaters, the Bauhaus Ost, the Max Kim Gorky Theater, and the Badische Staatstheater Karlsruhe. Karlsruhe. In Ukraine, she has directed documentary theater productions, some of which involved collaboration with internally displaced people and soldiers who served as paramedic in the war zone in East Ukraine. She has also directed several cinema projects. Her research areas of interest are documentary theater, documentary theater, and cultural trauma. So, Elisa, we're excited. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, before I begin reporting about um, on contemporary theater practice and its theoretical framing in Ukraine, I would like to uh, briefly outline the context, uh, cultural and political background uh, in which Ukrainian theater operated since Ukraine became an uh, independent state in 1991. Uh, after the collapse of Soviet Union, uh, Ukrainian theater faced ideological uncertainty and financially unstable times. We don't know how the history of Ukrainian theater might have turned out if uh, avant-garde theater director Les Kurbas has not been killed during Stalin's Great Terror in the 30s, as very, as, uh, very many other uh, politically engaged uh, artists. His ideas of uh, philosophical theater uh, at that time foreshadowed anthropological approach to theater that was later developed by Jerzy Grotowski. <laughs> um, as a result of Soviet cultural politics, many Ukrainian theaters had uh, conservative directors with a strict hierarchy structure. Theater makers, uh, many theater makers left abroad, mostly they went to Russia, where financial support of theaters was better and they, uh, there they had better chances for pro professional um, work. Some well-known uh, contemporary Ukrainian dramaturgs uh, such as Natalia Vorozbyt or Maxim Kurashkin have studied in Gorky Literary Institute in Moscow and have worked there, uh, earning money uh, mostly by writing scripts for soap operas. First, Natalia Vorozbyt play Zhytia uh, Prostych, Life of Layman, was staged several times in Moscow, Toliati, Novorossiysk, and St. Petersburg. Her plays, as also plays of other Ukrainian playwrights, premiered by Russian dramaturgy festival Lubimovka and Nova Drama. Vorozbyt drama Zarnoschovyshe, Grain Store, uh, where she describes how a family of her grandmother survived uh, Holodomor, Great Famine in 1932-1933, organized by Stalin and the uh, Communist Party, contains memories of her grandmother. Vorozbyt recorded interviews with her, with her and uh, integrated them into her play. This play was uh, staged in Royal Court Theater and only many years after premiered in Ukraine. Plays from another Ukrainian playwright, uh, Anna Yablonska, were also staged for the first time in, in Russia. Uh, her drama Pagans, uh, Yazichniki, were awarded by uh, Russian magazine Iskustva Kino, Cinema Art, and was in regular repertoire in Theater Dog. She died in the age of 29 in a terrorist attack in Moscow airport, Damadiedavo, while flying to receive theater award for her play Pagans. Only after her death, Yablonska plays were performed in Ukrainian theaters. 
Russian theater critic Pavel Rudnev emphasized the importance of Russian theater landscape for Ukrainian playwrights. The importance of political status of Russian theater is shown by the fact that Ukrainian, Belarusian, Central Asian, and Caucasian theatrical and dramaturgical phenomena find success more often in Russia than in their own countries with their extremely weak infrastructures. Before uh, the Yevromaidan revolution in uh, 2014, uh, Ukrainian theaters were still experiencing infer inferiority complex, a result of long-term policy of the Russian Empire and later Soviet Union with its centralization in Moscow. This has changed radically after Yevromaidan in 2014 and beginning of the war in eastern Ukraine. Many Ukrainian playwrights have finished professional cooperation with Russia, as, as also many theaters uh, that cooperated with Russia, and began to write and perform only in Ukrainian language. According to official statistic from 2015, so it's statistic from six years ago, in Ukraine uh, we have 113 theater houses like state theater houses. I think it's almost the same uh, number as in Poland. Uh, it is 19.3% uh, less than in 2010. Practically in every region center in Ukraine, we have at least one uh, Stadttheater house, so state theater. Many drama theaters were built dur during so Soviet Union times. Uh, biggest regional theater centers are in Kyiv, in Lviv, Odessa, and Kharkiv. Kharkiv in eastern Ukraine has also a long theater tradition. In 1990s, uh, 1934, Kharkiv was the capital of Soviet Union, uh, Soviet Ukraine, uh, and in the uh, 20s, Les Kurbas was working in his famous Berezil theater there. Um, Experimental and conventional, unconventional formats are found rather in small underground theaters, like Theater Dach by Vlad Troitsky in Kyiv, for example, and theater festivals, uh, maybe with an exception of Les Kurbas Theater, uh, that in Lviv that continued uh, the tradition of philosophical theater. Uh, another theater in Lviv that is open for new formats in is the Lviv Drama Theater of Lesia Ukrainka. The, there they also had experience in uh, giving some theater pedagogy laboratories or uh, staging post-documentary as they define it uh, in their web page and immersive uh, theater uh, projects. One of the biggest roles in the history of independent Ukrainian theater since 2007 has played uh, Gogol Fest Festival, uh, where many international theaters toured and collaborated with Ukrainian um, theaters, infusi uh, infusing them with new impulses and inspirations. An important role for Ukrainian theater also uh, belongs to international cultural institutions such, uh, like Goethe Institute uh, or international programs, European theater conventions that organized uh, some uh, programs for Ukrainian theater makers uh, in uh, um, practice like in Germany, in uh, Georgia and in uh, Austria. Uh, and East, uh, East European Performing Arts Platform and there was very active uh, Polish dramaturgy uh, and director, Joanna Wichowska. Um, uh, the market conservatism of Ukrainian state theaters may be rooted in the old fashioned educational system that we have in Ukraine. From the information on uh, official web pages of Ukrainian universities, it appears that we have 17 universities all over Ukraine that offer study in uh, theater direction, play, and theater studies. Um, the most popular universities are uh, Na Kyiv National Karpenko Kari, uh, Theater, Cinema, and Television University, Kharkiv State University of Arts, and Ivan Franko National University of Lviv. So in Central, in, in Eastern, and Western uh, Ukraine. Uh, a course program of Lviv University uh, looks uh, the most modern. 
The program features post-colonial studies in theater, uh, a rare occurrence in Ukraine. There is also a module in, in theory and practice of contemporary theater, where students analyze uh, theater styles of Romeo Costellucci, Ostermeyer, Christian Lupak, Krzysztof Warlikowski, Pina Bausch, Sasha Waltz, Jacques Lecoq, Robert Wilson, Tadeusz Kantor, and others. A course integrative theater covers such subjects as theater therapy, interactive and socially engaged theater, and documentary theater. A uh, Ukrainian theater scholar, Ulyana Roy, who made her postgraduate studies in theater pedagogy in Warsaw <laughs> University, uh, I think by Justyna that you mentioned, uh, is teaching a course of theater pedagogy for actors and theater researchers uh, to students of in their fourth year of studies in Lviv University. This uh, theoretical course exists already for three years and consists of nine lectures and nine seminars. This course has been running for only three years and it's uh, too soon to speak about results, but some students of Ulana already gave courses in rhetoric in re regional schools. Two weeks ago, uh, I had a conversation with Ulana and um, uh, uh, we discussed possibilities of involving, involving new audiences for this course. Uh, Unfortunately, in the interdisciplinary approach is not supported in Ukrainian higher education. It means that students who study, for example, pedagogy in Lviv can't take Ulana's course in the Faculty of Arts uh, as an option model. Basically, theater pedagogy is taught to actors who are more interested in professional career uh, and theater researchers uh, who study theater from theoretical point of view. One of Ulana Roy colleagues, Anastasia Toros, was teaching in Ukrainian Catholic University a module in drama education for uh, students who non-theological students, uh, historians, programmists. Uh, there is also a social and pedagogy department in Ukrainian Catholic University where students could be also interested in theater pedagogy. So Ukrainian Catholic University with its modern approach is an outlier, uh, outlier within Ukrainian educational system. Um, as was mentioned by Hungarian uh, colleagues, uh, social recognition of uh, theater pedagogy uh, is, uh, is lacking. Um, uh, is, it's actually theater pedagogy is rather a new term in Ukrainian context. From Soviet Union, we have uh, a long tradition of so-called hurtki uh, clubs at schools and in jazz cultural hubs, a phenomenon of school theater or unprofessional amateur theater is considered as something inferior and is not supported, as uh, not social recognized. Uh, mostly school theaters uh, work with classical drama texts. It was also the case in my school and in all, almost all other schools all over Ukraine. Ulana Roy uh, proposes to distinguish a term of theater pedagogy and pedagogy of theater. Theater pedagogy is a practice to work using theater methods with, for example, schools, uh, children and teenagers, and pedagogy of theater as a practice to work with public who visit theater. Uh, one of the most uh, recent theater pedagogy projects that was aimed uh, bring together teenagers from Western and Eastern Ukraine, uh, cities were that uh, from cities uh, in Eastern Ukraine that was the were damaged in the war conflict. Uh, that was a class act. Uh, it's a Scottish theater initiative that was adapted in Ukraine in 2016-2018. Uh, teenagers from these two cities in eastern and western Ukraine uh, meet in Kyiv and uh, they were working in mixed teams um, under supervision of Ukrainian dramaturgs on their own plays that were lately staged by professional directors and played by professional actors on a big theater stage. A central aim of this project was to ruin stereotypes about western and eastern Ukraine that was, that was also partly a um, cause of war conflict, uh, that these stereotypes are still very vivid. 
uh, but I found the realization of this project quite problematic because professional actors uh, who played um, uh, children, um, like children plays, acted exalted and kitsch and partly also cynical. Um, Drama Teen was a similar project called um, Laboratory of Teenagers Dramaturgy, realized uh, at first Ukrainian theater for children and Yas in Lviv. Uh, teenagers were working on their own plays under supervision of uh, professional dramaturgs, uh, playwriters Irina Haritz and Andriy Bondarenko. Uh, later teenagers' uh, plays were also staged by professional dramaturgs in this uh, theater. Uh, in the last part of my presen presentation, I would like to speak about documentary theater practices that is namely focus of my PhD thesis and also I worked as a, as uh, I also staged in Ukraine some witness performances uh, in post-play theater with a soldier and with internally displaced people and with school children. So a definition of documentary theater appeared for the first time in Ukraine uh, in 2007, uh, it was a premiere of verbatim play Adinochestva, Solitude, uh, by Vladimir Goreslavets in collaboration with other authors uh, in festival uh, Kurbalesi in Kharkiv. A method of verbatim was introduced for the first time by Russian theater doc. Uh, in Russia, this method was established and became popular through workshops of Royal Court Theatre, I think and uh, that inspired theater makers to open a theater space uh, the, uh, that was staging mostly only verbatim performances. In 2012, uh, London Royal Court Theater launched a theater project aimed to support a new generation of Ukrainian playwrights. Alice Doxon, director of international program of Royal Court Theater, visited Ukraine and organized a series of workshops for Ukrainian and Georgian dramaturgs. Uh, techniques of uh, verbatim were also introduced during these workshops. In 2009, uh, Kyiv Theatre Festival Week of Relevant Playing was established uh, and continued annually. Yelena Gre Gremina and Mikhail Ugarov from Theatre Doc conducted several times seminars and workshops about verbatim methods and inspired many contemporary um, dramaturgs to work with th this method. Uh, this uh, intensive engagement with documentary genre continued to uh, an emerging Sevolod Merhol Theater Center based in Kherson, it's in South uh, Ukraine, uh, which soon became one of the key actors in this field. Since 2008, uh, the director of this center, Mykola Homanyuk, a trained sociologist, implements sociological methods uh, such as qualitative interviews as one of the methods for composing documentary theater performance. Homanyuk launched uh, the documentary theater project called uh, Literally Democracy. Uh, performances preceded series of qualitative interviews that later were adapted to theater performances and their stage. The most popular topics of these documentary performances were power transparency, cor corruption in the Ukrainian university system, gender issues, homelessness, illegal building, and so on. Uh, documentary performances in this format had always followed a discussion that Homanyuk called uh, names public hearing. Uh, municipality, local community members, uh, sociologists, political scientists, lawyers, and citizens were invited to these hearings. Uh, the, the aim of them were to enable an impact of citizens on local policy making and building a network of activists. In 2010, 2009-2010, uh, activists of Herson Center for Young Initiatives Totem, uh, Totem and Meyerhold Center launched a project, Dialogue of Generations. In the frame of this project, uh, dozens of Second World War witnesses were interviewed among them were partisans, forced laborers, children of war. These interviews became the base of two verbatim performances. Ya pomnyu kak Lenin umer, I remember how Lenin died, and uh, swings. In 2012, Ukrainian writer Katerina Babkina initiated a theater festival document. 
uh, she was fasc fascinated by some Rimini protocol projects and wanted to invite them to Ukraine. So first festival document took place in December 2012 in Kyiv. Rimini protocol didn't manage to raise money to show their productions in real life. So they showed only video recordings uh, of some of their performances and Daniel Wetzel from Rimini Protocol uh, gave, made a two-day workshop. A second festival document tried to bring together different uh, theater productions from all over Ukraine. Uh, here was also shown drama, uh, Sashko Brahma controversial performance diploma based on interviews with students who were forced to give bribes to get good grades at universities. A new wave of documentary theater formats emerged, emerged with the Maidan revolution in 2014 and the outbreak of the war in eastern Ukraine. Uh, public readings of uh, Maidan Davis by Ukrainian playwright Natalia Vorozhbyt were first theater performance about recent events uh, of Maidan revolution engaging Maidan activists as witness together with professional actors who were also activists in, on Maidan. Actually, at that time, everybody was going on to Maidan. Uh, Natalia Borosbyt and director Andri Mai spent three months on the Maidan uh, talking to people, to students, to Cossacks, to doctors and volunteers, gathering their testimonies to create a verbatim play based on around 80 hours of interviews. Uh, she, she told in an interview uh, that actually this kind of gathering and uh, interviews that she asked uh, for uh, by uh, protesters, it was a kind of therapy for them uh, because uh, it was a uh, very intense time and they came to this gathering as a kind of release to speak about the problems, about their, uh, yes, about their exhaustion with um, yeah. On December 2014, Natalia Varushbrit and Andri Mai um, started to, uh, to meet a few times a week to exchange thoughts and feelings about events on Maidan. Uh, yes, uh, in, and then it was developed to the play Maidan Diaries. Another interesting participatory project about revolution is a Maidan audio walk uh, by um, Peak Peak Company, um, Dmitro Levitsky and Peter Armanovsky um, uh, were found, uh, has founded this company. Uh, every participant of this audio walk was gu guided by a voice in smartphones through main protest area, Maidan Nezalezhnosti, uh, revision in key events of Yevro Maidan demonstrations. Uh, this audio walk was also based on Maria Berlinska narrative story who was actively participating in Maidan protests. Uh, actually, this uh, Maidan audio walk is a second performance uh, by Pick Pick. A first was uh, in the case of Mendel Beides. Um, Dmitro Levitsky, the author of this audio walk, was consulting with Rumini Protocol uh, member Daniel Wetzel while working on this audio walk. Um, one of the most interesting and innovative discursive theater projects that also appeared during revolution time is documentary theater work Expertiza um, by expert analysis by Kyiv-based performance group Tanz Laboratorium. This project was inspired by workshops of uh, also Wetzel uh, in 2013 and Borov's the game structure introduced by um, Daniel Wetzel. By doing this performance, Dance Laboratorium, Dance Laboratorium opened a forum and engaged discussion on crucial political issues and in this way helped to restore broken communication between different sides of the conflicts. One of the key actors in Ukrainian documentary theater scene after Maidan was theater of displaced people uh, that staged only witness performances. Uh, this theater was established in 2015 uh, just one year after the beginning of the war uh, by the German director jo uh, Georg Genot, who previously worked in Russia, mainly in Theater Dog and Josef Boys Theater, and uh, Ukrainian playwright Natalia Vorozhbyt, and supported financially by German embassy in Ukraine. 
in theater of displaced, uh, uh, displaced actors uh, by themselves um, were uh, s uh, reflecting on their traumatic war experiences, such as uh, being in captivity or surviving uh, shelling. This theater became a place of integration, empowerment, and re rehabilitation, mainly for internationally, internally displaced uh, people and soldiers who uh, participated in uh, anti-terrorist operation in the war in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, Janor argued that witnessing personal crisis that is connected with political changes, such as displacement or psychological problem of resocialization after uh, coming back from the war, uh, like for soldiers, uh, helps them to heal wounds and overcome crisis, re reintegrate. Theater of Displays uh, opens with a performance, Where is the East? Uh, giving a stage to various voices of internally uh, displaced people from Luhansk and Donetsk. Go Georg Janot wanted to build a kind of communi community for displaced people based in the small studio in the territory of Kyiv, uh, Alexander Dovzhenko studio. Sita had also a psychologist who helped the actors to work with their trauma like this internally displaced people uh, and gain empowerment through production of communi and community buildi building. In 2015-2016, uh, in Ukraine, some theaters and many NGOs, especially Theater for Dialogue, uh, that was working with Augusto Boal concept of Theater of the Oppressed, developed performances with internally displaced. Uh, in documentary musical A Pie of Parallel Reality in Kharkiv uh, by Vladimir Goroslavets, who was a director, uh, narrative stories of displaced people um, uh, from Donetsk, Luhansk, and Crimea, uh, mixed with uh, songs and music compositions also written by displaced people. Uh, this performance is a witness to emotional and painful stories of displacement, memories about bombing native cities, uh, experience of young soldier who just come ba came back from uh, war, a story of journalists describing Russian nationalism growing after Maidan, uh, describing Russian propaganda and manipulation strategies uh, during annexation of Crimea and uh, also nationalism growing after Maidan in Ukraine. Uh, also there, there were also uh, one musical, uh, musical theater documentary project called uh, uh, Documentary uh, Performance Penita Opera um, that uh, collects, that is based on real stories of women that um, uh, that were, uh, how it's called in English, that were um, in prison for the whole their life. And uh, this perf uh, th then uh, dramaturgy uh, wrote a script and this uh, uh, was staged as an opera in 2016. And this project was uh, realized in cooperation with uh, Euro e European pres uh, prison uh, um, European Prison uh, Network and Kharkiv Human Rights Group. Um, yes, that is also an example of uh, like musical documentary performance that we had in uh, last years. Um, uh, another important uh, uh, witness performance called I Veteran uh, that was initiated by NGO Pobratime that works with uh, uh, ATO soldiers who came back from the war and um, have problems with reintegration and adopting to normal life. And uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Ukraine uh, that also supported this documentary performance. Uh, the aim of this project was to at attract the attention of a wider audience to war experiences of veteran soldiers and uh, overcome negative stereotypes that exist in regards to them. Uh, the organizers also wanted to demonstrate actual problems of social rehabilitation of veteran soldiers and motivate other NGOs to engage themselves in helping initiatives for social and physical rehabilitation of veterans. 
uh, 10 veteran soldiers uh, reported in the form of monologues about them being wounded, uh, medical treatment, daily routine in war zone, uh, becoming depressed after returning to civilian life and their imprisonment by separatists. Their stories are accompanied by the military orchestra of Ukrainian armed forces. This performance took place uh, on a big constructed open air stage in front of the Foreign Ministry of Ukraine in October 2016. Uh, organizers uh, also engaged professional playwright Natalia Vorosbyt, who helped uh, structuring veterans' monologues. Uh, this uh, this performance uh, had also English subtitles to enable uh, to invite uh, the invited foreign ambassadors, uh, who some some of whom have helped soldiers uh, with soldiers' treatment uh, to better understand uh, their stories. Uh, theater of Displaced uh, has no more ongoing uh, theater performances during last three years. But uh, Georg Genot is working since 2019 with teenagers in Bakhmut, Popasna, and Nikolaevka, it's a uh, small city in eastern Ukraine, uh, on a city project, Misto Soboyu, City to Take Away, where teenagers develop performances uh, where they describe their everyday life in, their th in these three cities uh, in eastern Ukraine. On the website of this project, you can find personal diaries of these teenagers. Genot states that this project is aimed to help teenagers to overcome war traumas by sharing their stories and observations with a wide audience. Uh, they also had guest performances in Berlin, Potsdam, and Vienna last uh, in 2019, uh, and recently having guest performances in Eastern Ukraine. Similar project titled Vidlik uh, Countdown is an initiative of young director Evgenia Vidisheva. Evgenia was working for free with no institutional support with teenagers from cities in eastern Ukraine that were damaged in the war conflict and created witness performances with them. Besides uh, terms documentary and witness theater, uh, in Ukraine we have also terms of integrative theater, for example, Ulyana Roy in Lviv leads a theater group, uh, Love, uh, Love and Tears, where people with mental disabilities uh, are welcome as actors. Uh, also, immersive theater and post-documentary theater. Post-documentary term was established by theater critic Anastasia Hashenets to describe theater projects that combine fiction and facts quotes from interviews, biographical information, and so on. Uh, discussions after performances is also very a uh, very important part of uh, witness performances and documentary uh, plays. Uh, sometimes it has even more bigger va va value than in performance itself. Um, Documentary and witness theater practice still play a marginal, marginal role in Ukrainian theater institutional uh, productions. This is also a result of precarious work conditions faced by those who organize these projects and those who participate in them. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Elisa, for that uh, very interesting report that um, I think linked beautifully to what we heard before the break and um, at least made me further some thoughts that I had there, so I'm excited about the discussion that will follow. But um, first now, and I'm suspecting it's also linking in um, one way or the other, we'll get um, the next uh, country report by Kat Yuglavu. Uh, who is a Romanian non-binary LGBTQIA plus activist, theater maker, poetry writer, and drag performer. They studied stage acting at the National University of Theater Film in Bucharest um, as their BA. And now we're happy to have them as a student in the Master of Applied Theater here. 
since 2018, they are a co-founder and artistic director of Creators Ensemble in Berlin. Their topics of interest are directed towards community building, somatic art therapy, and generative theater methodolo methodology. Mainly working with LGBTQIA plus narratives, they desire to strengthen one's personal voice as an individual and community through embodied artistic work. Kat, we're excited to hear your report. Oh, thank you, Judith. Thank you, finally, I'm here. Um, yes, this is it. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Uh, to uh, hello to everybody watching. Uh, perhaps in Romania. I hope so. Bună ziua. Hello to those that are in the room. Yes. And. I thought I would like to change to a bit of more of a dynamic <laughs> presentation. And this is something that uh, 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 that Ulrike and Andreas and Judith inspired this thought and this impulse in me that I would just like to walk around whilst I'm walking, at least for a part of my, uh, whilst I'm talking, um, at least for a part, I will come from time to time to change the the slides, um, yes, as you can see, <laughs> performing arts uh, in context Romania. Um, I think it's very important uh, before we start to give an account of uh, what's going on in Romania to perhaps contextualize and talk a bit about our history. Well, the history of my country, <laughs> not our common shared history. Although I must admit this is a very, very hard task to, to prepare a report that has a historical aspect to it because history is biased, right? And it's also commodified. So it just made me question whose history am I representing here? Who am I talking about? You know, so however, I also can see the bias and I <laughs> tell you that my view is also very much biased and very much um, focused on the information that I know. Um, this is a report that has been made in collaboration with a few other people, and perhaps I'm mentioning them now so I don't forget at the end. And this is Professor Dr. Bogdana Darie from the National University Caragiale in Bucharest, Andrea Zitman, uh, Stefan Alexandra Vera, uh, Romina Boldashu, and Victor Bodoi. Thank you so much. This has been a collaborative work. I am just the show person uh, to say so. I'm just here to make it fun and therefore you won't find all the information. Uh, I won't give you all the information that you will find in the report. Therefore, I advise you to read the report. Right. Enough about that. We move forward. So we have Romanian theater in a social context. And I argue, and many people would argue that, you know, popular theater or uh, theater in society has existed for a very, very long time, you know. Modernity did not invent the wheel of uh, theater in education or uh, performativity in open space. Um, Romania has still a very strong hold to the influences of the like rituals of dating back to the 10th and the between the 10th and the 19th century. Um, we also see in the 18th century the first forms of teatru școlar, which means theater in education or theater in schools. Um, and the uh, emancipation of theater, to say so, or the classical form, the institutionalized form, just starts to flourish 200 years ago, which is in the 18 and the 19, um, um, 18th century, and it's still emancipating, I would say. Um, right, so we move to our <laughs> historical landmarks, and I had a lot of fun preparing this portion because it's very new. It's like last week I had this thought. I was like, yeah, but what happened before, you know, before theater and education as it is right now? So um, 
I had a look and I know some of the traditions and these are the 10th to the 17th century. I find this one's very interesting because they are like, they are secular, so they don't belong to uh, orthodoxy or Catholicism. They're just ways of um, coming together for, uh, for the people in rural areas, sometimes also small urban areas, a way to celebrate, a way to um, sometimes keep away the, the bad spirits or, um, and I would say, uh, uh, sometimes to bring the good seasons, the summer, for example. And I will um, tell you a bit about Bregaika, which is uh, which is a dancing event. Uh, it's also um, um, a pair making event, right? People go and they socialize, and who knows, the spark might come out. Um, it's an agrarian tradition. It is meant to. It, it is happening at the um, during the summer solstice. Um, it is also a form of uh, of pray, if you want, if you will, to the nature that the season won't be too dry. Um, and you will see this is a <laughs> depiction, very accurate. <laughs> it is a painting, in fact, and. Um, <laughs> um, one of my favorite uh, of, of this uh, like traditions would be um, kuchi, which is the cuckoos, you would say. You know, these birds that go cuckoo, right? And I like it because it reminded me a lot of, uh, of the contemporary type of physical theater. And I will tell you how. Also drag, it has an element of drag in it. Because this is a, this is a tradition performed mainly by men it is a tradition in, in which men dress up as women, but also as men. So you have two sides, and they beat each other. They beat each other up, right? So this is where the physical theater aspect comes <laughs> into, um, into it. Um, there, is, there is this, uh, I came across this story that uh, women have tried to protrude into this tradition, however, the <laughs> the beating uh, uh, tradition was uh, quite rough. Uh, <laughs> so this tradition dates back from the 10th century, and they beat each other to have luck in the upcoming uh, year. Well, this is a tradition that is still happening nowadays in, in small areas uh, near Bucharest. This is still happening. People get dressed up. Perhaps the costumes are not as fancy. People have learned to improvise. You have Halloween costumes, demons, Satan. Um, and people go out in the streets and they, they beat each other. <laughs> I, I, I just can't get <laughs> sick of saying that. Um, what happens in the 18th century is that the Orthodox Church you know, um, starts saying, well, this, this theater thing is quite interesting, and we also want in the deal, right? So they start also putting their work to it, and they come up with some forms of theater, like Irozi, Gieni, Capra, Vikleimul, which comes from Bethlehem, for example. So it all, it all um, the theater, the, perform the, the, um, the performance gets a religious uh, uh, aura to it, but also it's, it has a shift in dramaturgy because for the first time you would have characters, you would have a narrative, perhaps sometimes you would have even text, which is biblical text. So it is quite an important uh, a moment to, to mention in the, in the history of performing arts in social environments in Romania. This is another, um, this is a beautiful picture of the Kukwaikele, which is the female cuckoo. Right? Um, of course, it's at its best. This is uh, tradition at, at its best. Uh, <laughs> okay. And we move. Let's not move here uh, because I also have something on my papers to talk about, and which is the school theater, uh, the theater, the first forms of theater in schools. We could call it theater in schools, theater in education. I'm not sure if we can. Um, um, it is a very important uh, landmark as well because 
um, the theater in schools in Transylvania represented the embryo of cult theater. So that's where the first form of, of what you would call nowadays cult intellectual theater was born from the mysteries of uh, and games of medieval carnival, firstly having pedagogical and also rhetorical purposes, and later moralizing and in part uh, social education. So teaching people how to get along with each other, Transylvania being a very uh, disputed uh, uh, landmark area, as uh, my Hungarian colleagues can perhaps confirm <laughs> this. Um, right. It is important to say that the Protestant and the Catholic Church is in the area have been using theater for a long time. They came up to the thought that this is also a good tool of indoctrination. So the but no, the Orthodox took their time, and then they said in the 18th century, okay, let's start it. <laughs> Good. So now that I'm done with this, I, what I call context, a bit, of a, a, bi a bit of a historical context, and you will see that we, to what I'm going to present from now on, which are uh, modern-day impulses, we will keep coming to different elements from this uh, from these traditions, different uh, types of performativity perhaps, or different claims, social claims. Um, and we move to Teatrul cu Deținuți, as we say in Romanian. Um, in English it would be a, a prison theater or theater with, with inmates and um, you know, it is well known that in the prison system, uh, a certain uh, repression of emotion and a, a certain, uh, um, in order to disguise weaknesses and it's being built, therefore this creates some sort of a hard shell, which makes it really hard for the inmates to reintegrate in society later on. And this was one of the, the, the main arguments for the introduction of this form of theater in, in prisons. It was theater would help ease up, would help um, prepare this transfer from inmate to yet again citizen in, a in the society. Um, and here it's really important to mention this, uh, this, uh, uh, this impulse, which is very unique in Europe. It's a theater festival for, uh, for inmates. Um, it started in 2009 and it's still ongoing. Um, it did not happen last year as many things didn't. Um, and this festival, um, its name, um, I its name is Dana Chenusha, which is the name of the, of the journalist uh, that created, that had the idea of this festival. And it has a, a bit of a pun in the title. I it says, unchaining through culture, right? So uh, for me, this is very much a, a, a dynamic uh, a practice, if you will, or, or a static term, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, this festival brings side by side inmates uh, and it also brings artists from the, from the theater practice, so actors, directors, and for a few months in a year, they, uh, they work together on creating a play which might might be selected for this festival because it became uh, um, two years ago it became um, the festival introduced a sort of scanning a sort of audition so the the best five theater groups will be selected to go to 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 the festival um, also a very a very uh, great impulse in, in theater in prison in Romania is uh, improvision, uh, improvisational theater, which is, of course, it's a technique of working into this place that go to the festival, but also sometimes it happens that it does not have uh, a finite result. So it is not always like result uh, focus, rather helping the inmates, as I said, to better reintegrate once they are, uh, they are free. Right, so another thing that I should mention is that um, uh, most of these uh, theater collectives from penitentiaries, uh, they engage with classical theater and uh, I'm noticing a bit of a trend, to be honest, looking at uh, what happened in the last years and one is Shakespeare. 
and one is Chekhov. So hello Russia. Um, but <laughs> but more recently, um, uh, creators together with inmates have started working more device, more applied if you want, in which their stories are voiced out and they find a uh, sort of mechanism in order to, to put that out, but also feel safe, don't feel that they're exposing too much of themselves in, in this festival. Uh, and I prepared some pictures. I prepared some pictures. Um, this is a, a picture of an inmate getting ready uh, before the performance at the Dana Chenusha Unchaining to Culture Festival. Um, and here you have Dana Chenusha herself. It's a quote which I thought it's pretty touching for me and for the context, the Romanian context, of course, and how we look at inmates. And it's important to notice the last sentence, perhaps, it says, I have to convince society that these people exist, that they are not on the moon. For them, theater is a form of freedom. Um, going forward, you know, uh, me as the, as, the <laughs> as, the, as, the, as the feminist that I am, I was like, but okay, this is happening only with men. I want to see if this is happening in female, pr in women's prison. And I was right, this is also happening in women's prison. And um, it's important to perhaps mention this project, uh, uh, which is called Selfie it, um, in Cluj. It is a very unique uh, uh, impulse because it collaborates with the National Theatre of Cluj and it becomes part of the repertoire. It became part of the repertoire a few years ago. And this is a format that is starting to kind of uh, um, catch more, um, how to say, more initiative. I'm, I'm sorry, I did not write all my words on the paper, <laughs> so sometimes I might just, okay. Uh, moving forward to uh, Centrul de Teatru Educacional Replica or the Replica Center for Educational uh, Theater. This is also, I it's a wonderful impulse that started back in 2015. Um, it, is, uh, it is an impulse generated by theater makers, but also with experience in theater pedagogy. And they deal with uh, terms such as social theater empowering minorities. One of their main agendas is to empower minorities um, in Bucharest. So just to say this uh, project is based in Bucharest. Um, pedagogy as a shared process, which means perhaps uh, learning, uh, the children, the youngsters learn from each other and also uh, the, the peers, the teachers learn from the children. There, are, there isn't, uh, quite a hierarchy established in this. And a free-for-all culture, which um, in this context means that uh, all, the, all the performances are free, everybody has access to them, all the discussions as well. Right, so as, as I was saying, it's an independent interdisciplinary space. It's promoting the collaboration between professional artists and members of vulnerable uh, communities. Um, I think I've already said uh, it focuses very much on mutual education through artistic means. It looks, and very important, it works with contemporary dramaturgy. Some of the initiators of this program, of, of this, uh, of this uh, theater company and project are uh, also theater writers, dramaturgs. Um, and uh, let's look a bit into some of the materials. It's, uh, it's also, uh, it started out as a very small space and recently it's been getting some funding from the uh, National Administration for Culture and a bit of recognition from uh, the British Council. Uh, and here we have one of their uh, um, 
one of the projects that opened up this uh, this theater, which is Familia Offline. It's uh, the play. It's written by Mihaela Mihailov. Uh, she's one of the co-founders of of Replic. Radu Apostol also a co-founder. Uh, Familia Offline. It's a story. It's a it's a performance with with kids uh, that have parents that have left to work in the West, in Spain, Italy, and how how do these kids deal with the absence of their parents and what impact does this have on their on their upbringing? Um, moving forward, am I going too fast? No, I could go faster. <laughs> <also>. <laughs> um, <coughs> right, we are. That's okay. I wanted to do that. Uh, another wonderful impulse that deals with uh, the rights uh, of. Uh, of a minority in, in Romania is the independent theater company, uh, Roma feminist theater company, Juvli Pen. Um, Juvli Pen in Romani language means feminism, uh, which was founded in 2014 by Roma actress Mihaela Dragan and Zita Moldovan in collaboration with uh, the director Mihai Lukac and they are concerned in particular on offering a vi uh, an emancipatory vision and affirmative about Roma women. Um, and it has become a platform in which the experiences of Roma women are being represented and thus made more uh, visible. Um, you know, Jubilee Pen doesn't necessarily define itself as a, how do you say, as a spokesplace. So a, pl uh, a place that speaks for for the entire Roma experience, but rather it practic uh, it practices uh, political, provocative, experimental um, art. Um, they very very often uh, choose topics such as racism and reducing social stigma uh, of Roma. Uh, of Roma people in Romania and racial discrimination, authority, uh, gender inequality, uh, historical discrimination against Roma, which is a big, big deal in Romania. I mean, I, I, I think it's a big, big deal in Europe altogether. Um, but Romania being the country with the biggest uh, uh, population of Roma people. Um, We'll get to that when we're done. I'm going to tell you a bit about the work of, of Juvli, Juvli Pen. Um, another very specific thing that Juvli Pen uh, brings to, to, to this performing arts in context table is uh, the talk about inaccessibility to education of Roma people um, and public health and also reproductive rights of Roma women. Uh, Juvli Pen also desires the the founding of a national uh, Roma State Theater, being the second largest minority in Romania. There is a claim to that, uh, and there is absolutely no institution that would bring together uh, Roma makers, actors, uh, directors, on so playwrights. Um and I was telling you about um, the performances that uh, that Juvli Pen has proposed since 2014 onwards. Uh, but before we get to that, there are some terms here which I would like to uh, to add to uh, perhaps my own uh, presentation glossary. <laughs> um, it's challenging art, highly performative social art, queer performativity. Romachen, which is uh, Roma Futurism, I will tell you a bit about that as well, and uh, theatrical self-representation. Uh, Jubilee Pen works a lot with self-representation, as I say. Here, Romachen. So um, there is this, uh, there is this, 
new current going around Europe and it's called Roma Futurism. And um, I happen to, to, to be a friend of Mihaela Dragan who kind of coined the term to say so during a residency uh, in Hong Kong at uh, Parasite uh, Art Space. Um, Roma Chen, it is the age of the witch. It marks the birth of a new artistic trend, Roma Futurism which we hope will be taken over by many Roma artists in order to move to the next level, where we imagine a future in which we can stop the, histo we can stop the historical cycle of oppression against us. Roma futurism claims the figure of the Roma witch, so stereotyped in the collective imaginary, and witchcraft becomes our artistic and political response to the social inequalities and injustices in the world we live in. And this is what Mihaela Dragan said back in 2019 regarding this Roma chain, um, this the, ro the, the current of Roma futurism. Uh, Roma chain is also a performance happening in uh, Romania. It premiered back in 2019. Um, it talks about the techno witch, and it makes beautiful use of um, holographic projections, as you can see. Of of tarot, it also has an aspect of of sci-fi queerness. Uh, it it demystifies the the Roma female body and um, also has sort of a of of a claim, right? A bit of a manifesto claim to to the future that is about to come. Um, another project that I would like to mention is Kali Trust, uh, which is um a project uh, directed by Mihai Lukac. Uh, Kali Trust in uh, Romani means black fear, and this is the name that the Roma people, one of the names that the Roma people gave to the Holocaust. And Kali Trust deals with the realities of those deported in Transnistria uh, during the Antonescu regime. This is like communism, I, we didn't mention that, but um and uh, about the genocide uh, on roma people in romania which surprise surprise uh, um hasn't been recognized by romania just until recently this recognition happened um but it is still not very very talked about that's why i consider the work of 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 this company to be uh, of an extreme importance the other companies as well um so moving on and there we go this is how it all started um i've noticed uh, i've noticed today a bit of a trend to start with this theater in pedagogy and i must admit i had a bit of a doubt i was like am i just maybe i'm just getting this wrong because performing arts in context, uh, for me, I tend to look at the social context. And of course, theater and education, absolutely <laughs> important theater pedagogy. As Judith has said, I am a student here at Mozarteum at Applied Theater, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, when it comes to theater in education in Romania, we mentioned a bit uh, Teatru Scolar, which dates from like 300 years ago. Um, however, it stopped at, at some point. Uh, it, it, it stopped to, to, to become a, 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 bigger, a bigger current. It's always been an undercurrent. There's always been that Romanian teacher or that English teacher that would do some theater play in, uh, in school you know, in order to send an impulse to the students to maybe learn English or I don't know, understand better the history. Um, during communism, however, this trend kind of slowed down and we have this propagandist theater and a bit of popular theater here and there, but not that much theater in, uh, in education. But nowadays, uh, things are getting better and I am uh, looking uh, with optimism to, to the situation, although I wrote here there are very scarce offerings at the moment. 
uh, and by that I mean like independent theater companies that have an educational agenda, like Replica that we just mentioned. There's also Reactor in Cluj Napoca. Um, they are the so-called national palaces in Romania or palace of culture. They exist in the most hilarious uh, <laughs> places. Uh, to be honest, they exist everywhere. Some of them also have a, a educational theater project. Um, and there are around 10 to 15 private schools that also offer on their curriculum uh, theater education. Um, well, luck, com luck comes about, or unluck uh, for, uh, for many, is that the Romanian artistic market, the theatrical and also film market, is quite inflated. There are a lot of theater universities, there aren't that many jobs, or they're starting now because independent theater is really uh, getting bigger and bigger, so more jobs are being created. Um, however, m many of, this, uh, of the graduating students of, of theater academies look towards uh, theater uh, in education, theater pedagogy as a way to have work. So as I said, luck for the youngsters <laughs> and for those that get to have the interaction with them and unluck for perhaps an actor who really wants to be on stage but there's no, there's no job. Um, as I said, public school teachers from time to time they are engaging in directing school plays and um, I must say one of the reasons why I'm here is due to this public school teachers because I've been engaged in uh, school plays since uh, the third grade and I just kept on doing it, they kept on doing it and it really helped out to, to define perhaps uh, a way <laughs> or a possible way if we say so. Um, theater pedagogy looks at uh, theater as a tool for experiential learning, so we learn by doing, we learn by interacting, by coming together and this is a very interesting, uh, a very interesting uh, fact, also very real. It is the master program at the National University of uh, of Theater and Cinema in Bucharest. It is a program in Pedagogia Teatrală, we would say, which is theatrical theater pedagogy. Um, there were talks back in 2000, apparently, about forming such a master after uh, coming across the uh tie and die right so theater and education drama and education and also the theater pedagogy uh, of of germany so this this source of inspiration just came towards the uh, the university and uh, professor dr nikolai manda uh, extraordinary person um which i had the pleasure to meet got this idea to make to have a <laughs> to have a master degree in theater pedagogy. Went forward to the Ministry of Education. The Ministry of, Edu of Education was like, I don't know, do you think it really makes sense? Um, in the end, after a few years of negotiations, 12, uh, <laughs> they agreed to uh, have the first uh, uh, generation of students in uh, theater pedagogy. In 2012, this master degree opened its gates and um, another cool thing happening in <laughs> Romanian theater and education is that uh, thanks to this MA, thanks to this master degree students, which later on became PhD students, and they just wanted more. They didn't want just to, okay, we learned the deal, but where do we practice it? So uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Bogdana Darie, had the idea, why don't we just go again, talk with the Ministry of Education and propose that theater should be introduced in the curriculum of education as an optional, no stress at the beginning, one hour a week, one hour a week, really not much to ask. Uh, also, the European Union uh, says, uh, okay, well, creativity and social emotional development are some of the key uh, skills 
one of the seven uh, granted or desired by UNESCO and the Seoul Convention um, in a child. So why don't you do something about So it worked wonderfully because in 2019, uh, the Ministry of Education agreed to do us this great favor. Um <coughs> and but but the Ministry of Education wanted a bit more. They said, okay, but we should, oh wait, we had a picture, I forgot about this. Uh, this is me <laughs> in 2005. Uh, yeah, ignore the bottle of alcohol. You would think, what do they, why were they teaching you in uh, fifth grade, I think? Um, but as you see, again, again, we're, we're coming back to this like popular tradition, so we're not necessarily um, acting out uh, classical theater plays, but rather fairy tales or or popular stories, which has nothing to do with uh, the consumerism culture, Instagram popular. <laughs> yes, you know that. Um, Right here, uh, there's something more to mention. There's around 15 to 20 uh, youth theater festivals in the country, which are a wonderful impulse uh, for students to engage with uh, theater in schools. Um, okay, moving forward. And I was telling you about the plan of the Ministry of Education of dividing this module of option, this optional of theater and education in three, three parts to say so. So the first group would be third and fourth grade, and the module is called the stage and I. the The second module is addressed to uh, grades sixth uh, and seventh, and it's theater and us, which is you know facilitates the interaction. And the uh, 10th and 11th grade is called theater laboratory. So uh, I think is, uh, things are getting really serious in the 11th grade <laughs> when you can really sit in the laboratory of Grotowski here <laughs> and uh, really learn how to jump real high and do flips. Uh <laughs> right. Um, another w uh, another uh, um great thing that came out of the Master of Theater Pedagogy um, was the Una Teche Junior, which is a project to spread the word of, of theater and education, how great it is. It is a, a laboratory for experimentation as a tool to promote the benefits of theater education, as I said. And I mentioned here, we also at, Mozart, at uh, um, Applied Theater, we have Labor X, which is exactly the same initiative. And maybe a thought, maybe something we could borrow here as well. Uh, Una Teche uh, uh, Junior um, came up with this caravan. So they said, okay, if, um, if they don't come to us, we go to them, you know? Um, and not only in Bucharest, it's going outside into rural areas and working with children there. So um, this is an idea that I think uh, it's there to, it should be kept in, in, in a way. Right, so um, side note, I wanna add to the glossary of performing arts in context, uh, um, social emotional development here through theater, experiential learning, caravan of theater education. So these are more like dynamic practices, they're not terms, right? Um, we have some pictures, some pictures you can see, uh, they're also uh, divided on, 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 on groups. The caravan is divided on small preschool teens, and teenagers. Um, and if I'm not wrong, yes, <laughs> we are approaching uh, an end of this presentation. I just wanted to put into uh, into the last slide the the terms that I think are relevant for. Um, Performing arts in context in Romania. I thought of doing this uh, funny, fun 
fun, fun, not funny thing in which we all read the terms in Romanian. <laughs> um, but also we don't have to because uh, I feel we all need to get ready for Russia. So, <laughs> you know. I thank you so much for your attention and once again I thank to those that collaborated with me and helped write this report and um, there is much more to read into the actual report. You have statistics, you have dates, data, names, but I'll, I give you the pleasure, I'll let you have this pleasure on your own. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kat, for this indeed very dynamic presentation. <laughs> I certainly laughed and learned a lot. And um, I guess we are ready for Russia, aren't we? So <laughs> that would mean that next we hear Adam Mukina, who is a nomadic artist and theater maker with a focus on politically and socially engaged documentary and participatory performance. Her practice includes directing, performing, curating, writing, teaching, and researching. Ada graduated from the Russian State Institute of Performing Arts and holds an MA in Advanced Theatre Practice of the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama of the University of London. She was a founder of the theatre project um, MESTE, Russian collaborative theatre group that produced multiple community-based projects in theatre, museums, educational, and human rights um, organizations in 2012 to 2019. And she's an advisor and consultant for international theater festivals and art organizations, as well as a visiting lecturer at the art schools in Russia, the UK, and the US. Um, so Ada, here we go, the stage is yours. Hello. Um, wow, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. I will join the cat uh, in talking about that. It's extremely uh, stressful task to do a report about the country, especially if this country is so huge as Russia uh, and has such a diverse uh, experiences and diverse uh, geographical zones and 83 subjects, like a federal subject, and 84 different nations and ethnicities living in there. So um, to uh, make me, to help me uh, to do this task, um, can I also maybe? Yeah. Uh, I uh, developed a character that will help me to tell this story. Uh, this is the character. Uh, her name is Ada. And she is coming from St. Petersburg, which is really important for the story because St. Petersburg is um, a big city. It lays on the border with Europe European Union, with Finland. And it's much easier to come to uh, European Union countries ra uh, and much cheaper to come to Finland than, to, let's say, to Siberia. So uh, the experiences that she gathers are pretty much uh, like in a border in between Asia and Europe. And that also means that it's a city uh, which uh, has a lot of money and a lot of opportunities. And that's what how she knows theater in Russia. Um, what is also important that she uh, gets her first education in law. And she studied uh, and she her came to theater quite an unusual way so to say, through studying human rights, uh, civic education, 
street law, working with uh, children and students, explaining how the state is organized, how do you uh, claim certain things, what are the human rights, what, what rights do you have? And through that, uh, she came to, and always loving theater, she came to uh, understanding that she wants to do a different kind of theater, which she saw in cultural capital, St. Petersburg. And uh, she also as did a master first in St. Petersburg, and then, oops, that was quick, uh, she became what, what she calls a nomadic artist, meaning that she decided to uh, go on a journey and to learn from other countries how do they do uh, performing arts in context. And first she went to Germany for one year um, and um, learned different practices and went to rehearsals and uh, was reporting what she saw back to Russia. And then she studied in, in the UK, and then she traveled in between. And this all the experiences and this all the perspective uh, from where uh, and from which she will telling the story about how it is in Russia, right? Okay. And now I will also want to talk about uh, context of uh, where she does her work and where she did her work. Um, so socially engaged theater uh, in Russia. Um, when people talk about it in Russia, they uh, trace it back to revolution, 1917. And because there was a spirit of that we need to change how everything works, we need to democratize the culture, we need to do culture for all, we need to involve people, there should be participation, there should be not elite, uh, it should be for children, uh, it should be for everybody, uh, we need to uh, build this how you call this, palaces of cultures. We need to uh, build uh, twos, which is the theater for young audiences. And uh, we need to include workers and stuff and stuff. And because it's basically from 20s till 90s, the socially engaged art was really strong in Russia and was really forced, <laughs> so to say, from above. Um, that is why uh, after the Soviet Union uh, collapsed, uh, the artists finally, in the 90s, uh, thought that they finally have a freedom to create whatever they want without ideological pressure. So they don't need to work with workers if they don't want to, and they don't want to talk about whatever state tells them to do. They don't want to do socially engaged art. They want to finally do the Chekhov without any, you know, pressure and interpre interpreted it in whatever they want to do in complex things and fantasies and whatever. And um, that is why still in Russia, uh, nowadays when you go to big theaters and wha what is funded, uh, in, in theaters you basically found art for art's sake. You find this huge, beautiful production based on Stanislavski, Merhold, or connected to European culture. And um, directors of theater or intendants, they don't want to have in their theater anything socially engaged because they protect their freedom to create something without ideology. So that's how it is seen. So they want to uh, keep these practices out somewhere else. You can do it in the palaces of culture. Please not here, because we had it already. We're, we're good. <laughs> we don't want it. Um, but that's uh, basically where Ada, um, when she was studied law, and she was actually curious about the situation was going on in Russia. And she didn't see anything that would be in theater really representing what's going on and uh, reflecting on what's going on, in at least in St. Petersburg. Uh, and that's where she was thinking, OK, um, but I would like to do a different kind of theater. I don't see it, so how can I invent it? <laughs> so um, that's how Theater Project Mesti uh, was born in 2012. Uh, a little bit of a political context of 2012. Um, it's a huge demonstrations going on in Russia uh, about falsification on the elections. Um, then uh, a huge demonstration when Putin came to the third term. Um, 
third or fourth a uh, wave of immigration happening from Russia to Europe because after these protests were unsuccessful. Um, in schools, uh, they also, mm, before that, there was a kind of multicultural program in schools that we all, we are different nations in Russia and we all need to, how do we, you know, your culture, my culture, uh, how do we live together? 2012, they stopped this program and they said, we don't want this multi culti which is going on in Germany. Uh, it failed, as you can see. <laughs> we are Russia, we're going our way, we don't need to look at the West. So that's the context when basically I started my theater project. And I started, um, a first project was uh, children, teenagers from different nationalities of St. Petersburg, uh, with whom uh, we did a documentary research for one year together. Uh, we are going to different et ethnical communities. Uh, we were talking with people on the street, asking about uh, what is your nationality, how do you live with other nationalities, and making a performance out of that. Later on, this uh, theater project missed it out of one project, started to grow, and uh, there was more collaborators involved. We started to work with different topics, with teenagers, with different groups, with women, with homeless people, with migrants. Um, this project was never um, an NGO or any kind of uh, legal entity because at the same time, there was also some uh, laws enforced in Russia about being a foreign agent, if you work with LGBTQ topics or you get some money or you collaborate with embassies, you can get in trouble. So we decided not to uh, legalize the project and be like a free uh, fluid group that uh, just comes for one project to uh, catch up with the museum or with the theater and to collaborate with them. We worked with uh, quite big also institutions like Bolshoi Drama Theater, Hermitage Museum, uh, Garage Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, who at the same time were interested to try new things, uh, to work with different, because they also heard about, oh, there's something participatory, something interesting going on, we want to try these things. But basically that was a lot of the things that we were doing, it was just uh, learning by doing. And in St. Petersburg, I didn't know any other projects that were doing the same things. And uh, that's where systematization comes first. In 2013, I was interviewed about my first project for St. Petersburg Theatre Journal. And it was the first edition uh, where theater uh, critics decided to try to collect in one journal all the practices that were around Russia uh, that were dealing in some way with the socially engaged, unpopular uh, stuff. And that's how we basically learned about each other. So, um, oh okay, so there are basically a lot of people who are doing that. And so the community kind of started to build. Um, in that same uh, year, I started my master in theater academy in St. Petersburg, and I chose to write my master thesis about social theater as an interdisciplinary art, uh, which I needed to defend this uh, kind of um, topic because people were asking me, what do you mean social theater? All theater is social, what are you talking about? And that's uh, where um, I needed to, to justify my practice. I was also describing what I'm doing. I started to look for different resources uh, in English and started to find different, okay, so what's going on in other countries, and uh, basically did a map of different terms that are used in different countries. Applied drama, community mm, theater pedagogy, popular theater, blah, 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 blah. And so the next systematization happened in the next journal theater um, in Moscow. And basically my uh, thesis became one of the articles uh, in this uh, journal, where basically talking about definition of social theater in different, and mapping it. So the uh, edition is called Social Theater and Its Names. And um, also in 2015-18, there was also another systematization uh, happened also in St. Petersburg, uh, thanks to Goethe Institute, which uh, made an online bilingual magazine, German-Russian, Kulturelle uh, Bildung, in Russland, Deutschland, in Dialog for which I wrote already articles being in Deutsch, in Germany, 
uh, when I was visiting Schaubühne and seeing the theater pedagogy department or writing about foreign theater in juvenile prison in Germany. And, s and uh, so there was like uh, exchanging of the practices from both uh, sides. Uh, I'm telling, um, oh, Ada. <laughs> I'm telling it also from the perspective of Ada because I feel like my way of uh, getting into that was really kind of together with this wave that was also coming in and so I basically participated in definition of uh, a lot of the terms starting from the zero point of knowing no nothing. Um, okay, so social theater, why do we use this term? So this is basically, we don't use applied theater, we know this term, we don't use it. Uh, Social theater, um, I guess, I don't know, like how, I first for, for uh, I was uh, trying to describe what I'm doing, this theater project Misty, I just invented this term. I was thinking, okay, I'm interested about something social, like my first education, like human rights and social reality and theater, so social theater. But then I found out in Russia that actually common thing, uh, not only I <laughs> was using that. Um, and the way uh, I described it also when I tried to find the definition, I agreed with basically Richard Schechner and uh, James Thompson. They wrote a uh, joint uh, short article called Why Social Theater? And I found it quite a answer to my questions wi where they were saying that social theater is basically uh, theater that um, its goal is not only statical, but something else. So that's also an important thing. Um, and I would like to talk about three whales <laughs> on which social theater in Russia is based. So what is this mix? Theater pedagogy. Um, theater pedagogy in Russia trace, again, its kind of history from the Soviet and revolutionary uh, time, where, again, uh, it started with establishing theaters for young audiences, uh, where it was thinking it's important that you talk, and how do you talk about performances, how do you explain them, how you talk to the audience. Uh, students of Stanislavski Merhold also um, did a lot on this uh, field. And basically, uh, theater pedagogy is kind of trying to uh, still be based on that, not kind of cancel completely the discoveries that were done in Soviet time, but also interacting, of course, with German colleagues, interacting with uh, drama and, and education with English uh, tradition and seeing how they all kind of link together. Um, unfortunately, I think it's unfortunately, after the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, a lot of pedagogical departments that, that were already existing uh, in Soviet time were closed. And so there's a few still left. And so basically what in Germany is now like quite a normal thing to have a pedagogical department used, they, they, they were already, but now they're, no. <laughs> so that's kind of, um, uh, so we kind of try to, uh, new generation kind of try to reinvent uh, the thing. Uh, the second uh, whale uh, is a term inclusive theater. Um, Lisa was also talking about it, inclusive, meaning uh, working with uh, wheelchair users, people who have difficulties with hearing, um, with seeing, uh, with uh, mental uh, um, difficulties, uh, with autism, with Down syndrome and so on. Um, Ada would argue that unfortunately uh, this inclusive theater is kind of almost aids the understanding of social theater. So basically in Russia, when you talk about social theater, it's mostly talking about this area, which is a bit uh, sad for me because I think it's such a variety of like how you can use theater. Um, but there is still a third whale, of course, which is a documentary theater. Lisa talked uh, a lot about it. Um, I would also talk a, a little bit about theater doc and why it is important in Russia. Um, and of course in Russia and social theater, we also have a lot of, these are kind of the things that are more or less uh, grew from the Russian soil, being influenced of course from different winds. <laughs> but there are also some things that are brought from, from abroad, which we also have is uh, hospital clowns, of course, 
uh, street circus. We have uh, an amazing, in St. Inter- in Petersburg, we have an amazing circus called Uppsala Circus, which works with uh, teenagers, street teenagers, and using um, circus and acrobatics uh, to get them involved in physical training and to uh, help them socialize. Um, class act, Lisa already also mentioned that, the Scottish technique of uh, writing plays together uh, with school children. Forum theater, theater of the oppressed. Uh, I mentioned that today was not known so much in Russia. I was also one of the people who uh, I started a program called the Boal in Russia and uh, trying to introduce this method um, in Russia, uh, which is kind of, I don't know, it's kind of have difficulties with spreading. There's always a couple of people who are interested and then others who say, eh, social engaged theater. <laughs> We don't want that. Um, playback theater, also, we have these uh, groups. And now a bit about documentary theater, because um, also, like, a f- for Ukraine, it's quite an important thing. Um, theater Dog, Theater Dog, uh, has a slogan, motto, that is a theater where nobody plays, uh, nobody performs. Um, and it was uh, found in 2002. And uh, there is an influence linked to the Royal Court Theatre. So this theatre was established for by modern playwrights whose, sta- whose plays were not staged because in the uh, big theatres they were staging Chekhov and old guys, uh, dead guys, men mostly. Uh, and um, so they decided, okay, let's do our own independent theatre that would be focused on new writing. And um, they got connected to royal court. They taught them verbatim, blue, blue, blue. Okay, old story. But uh, why this theater became so uh, important in Russia? Um, I think uh, the reason is that we have a, a lack of independent media. Uh, the um, journalism, uh, which is one to talk about what's going on, is kind of pushed and oppressed. And we had just recently our independent uh, online media, Medusa, was um, called a foreign agent. They got a foreign agent status, and now they lost all the um, people who were paying them to show the advertisements. So they basically, there's a new, again, kind of a new aggression against uh, independent media. And basically, Theater Dog became, uh, or took this task of documenting what's going on. So they... Um, Elena Greymana, one of the founders of this theater, was saying, when you cannot change what's going on, document it. So that was the motto. They do, they do the plays about tortures by the police. They do uh, the plays um, about um, court uh, and uh, deaths of human rights defenders, uh, about the terror attacks, um, basically about everything, uh, what's going on. And that's why this tradition, th- th- this theater uh, was pushed several times out. It, like it lives in a small underground, uh, uh, literally underground <laughs> uh, place. And then they're kicked out like several times uh, last year again. But they just don't care. They find a new underground small place, renovate it, and just continue doing that, which is amazing. Um, but... I mean, not all documentary theater is considered social theater. So what I would put in on the side on the social theater would be, again, what uh, Lisa was mentioned, theater of witness. And a couple of examples um, is one uh, which actually was recognized called the Golden Mask. So it's like the highest uh, national award, which is quite unusual uh, to get to this kind of verbatim strange thing. Uh, it's uh, a kin opera by Sevlo Kisovsky. Uh, where he invited uh, immigrants for the South uh, ex-Soviet republics, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, these um, migrants coming to Moscow uh, to work, earn money, being gastarbeiter, that's actually the term that we in Russia are used, gastarbeiter, living in horrible conditions, uh, and um, quite often illegal. Uh, and he found... An a couple of immigrants who were artists back in their homeland, who were singing, who were actors, who were musicians. And so basically on their on this performance they do 
tell their stories, how do they came to Moscow and what do they do now, but also they play and they sing and they do their professional, uh, what they were trained for. Uh, and the other example I would give is from our practice, uh, the performance that I directed and uh, together with the playwright um, Natasha Barenka. It's called 18th Diary with a blue cover and a teapot on it. Um, this is a performance that was a result of a um, three-month research together with a group of teenagers uh, in our project that we called School of Documentary Theater, where we uh, took teenagers um, and we kind of learned taught them all the process of creating documentary plays, so not just uh, taking them as interview partners, but really starting with, like, okay, so what are the questions we wanted to learn? Uh, how do we do the interview? Uh, how do we record interview? How do we transcribe interview? How do we do monologues out of interviews? How do we play monologues? How do we put monologues into a nice setting? And how do we actually perform it? So in three months, we basically were going through this whole stages and this particular performance was um, focused on the question of uh, others who is other what is otherness and uh, who is us who who, who am I and um, they came up some different uh, monologues um, which uh, were about identity there was uh, one transgender monologue of a one teenager uh, there was one monologue about the first love and being a homos realizing for the first time that you actually uh, have probably you're homosexual and you have this feeling to the same gender but you don't know yet um, and it also happened giving you the context 2014 there was the law uh, enforced against um, LGBTQ propaganda meaning that you cannot talk uh, about LGBTQ issues to the minors under 18, which is crazy because these are the people who are feeling that and who are actually experiencing that. And we discussed with them how do we do, like, can they talk <laughs> about it themselves to other minors on the stage or not? And how do we do that? Um, so that was the, um, our fight. Uh, and the other term, which is now becoming more popular after, I think, uh, a small discussion and discovery of a bit of colonial roots of documentary theater, and Teatro Doc is now rethinking a bit of their strategy that they were using uh, in early 2000s when they were going to some region in Russia, do some verbatim play. The actors would reenact local accents, and uh, local ways of speaking and acting, and you go to these freaks. Uh, they, they were always saying that it's really hard to do verbatim play about intelligent people because they have this barrier, they don't want to let you in, but it's always cool to, it's easier to do it with marginal groups, like uh, homeless people. They are easy to talk to and then easy to uh, show on stage. And so this is something that is now uh, in debate, if, if it's a really <laughs> good way <laughs> to uh, <laughs> do that. And so that's uh, now the new term is now a bit more uh, becoming popular, uh, with it which is Teatr Garajan, Citizens Theater, or Theater of People also, um, which is also linked a bit to the tradition of Bürgerbühne. So I'm also like writing a lot about what's going on in Germany. So I mean, it's kind of all in, in dialogue, we did a laboratory of the Citizens Theatre uh, online last year in pandemic and it was nice because Miriam Zoll, who probably most of you know, she joined also uh, to discussion with the Russian practitioners from different uh, cities. Uh, okay, moving on to the next one, inclusive theatre. Um, that's also something that started uh, quite early, but I mean after 90s still. One of the famous groups is called Integrated Theater Studio Krug 2, Krug 2, second Krug. <laughs> Krug is a basically circle. Um, and it's one of the groups that work with uh, people with different disabilities. 
um, making a lot of physical performance. An interesting thing, um, I think, Anna, yeah, you were speaking in our discussion about that you needed to establish this MA in order to leg legitimize kind of the practice of facilitators and saying that they also get a training. And I think an interesting thing that also happens with legitimization, is it the word? <laughs> <laughs> um, of such practices, which are still, you know, wh what I said, they are pushed outside, they're not happening on main stages, they're not happening inside theaters. Uh, it's when uh, somebody, uh, some European guy comes. <laughs> And so uh, this studio, their director made uh, a co-production with uh, Gerd um, Hartmann from Tikva Theater from Berlin. Uh, they did a uh, together performance, which got a golden mask again, so the main award. And after that, uh, inclusive theater became a thing, <laughs> which is good, but yeah, whatever, whatever means it takes, right? Um, Another project I want to talk about is uh, quite a new one. It's in St. Petersburg. It's called Quartira. It existed for a short period of time. It's kicked out now, and then it's now finding new uh, ways to live. Um, it's it is a project with uh, people with autism spectrum. It's a theater project which started um, first impulse was from. Uh, Boris Pavlovich is one of the directors who is working a lot in inclusive theater. He started to work in Bolshoi drama theater, tried to sneak in uh, people with autist uh, spectrum inside, got a bit uh, of um, push from one of the big actors from this famous theater saying, this is not a cultural palace, why there is this strange people walking in the corridors? But he, uh, Boris is uh, quite a smart guy. He kind of sneaked and continued doing the work. And after three uh, years of working, they did the performance in Bolshoi Drama Theater, showed that once. Uh, no, I don't think anybody wanted to continue to show it. But then they again go to Moscow and got uh, some attention for Golden Prize, a Golden Mask. So now this performance is uh, still in repertoire. And sometimes it is also shown on the big stage. But only, I think, from this kind of legitimation. legitimization. Um, and after that, uh, Boris, uh, with his uh, colleagues, they found an apartment in St. Petersburg, old apartment uh, in Russian Kvartira, uh, where they um, just basically did an immersive experience for people uh, who will come and they will interact with actors and it would be like three, year, three hours uh, experience and they work a lot also with um, absurdist poets, absurdist literature of Russia and 30s, which fits really well to the kind of context of uh, this whole kind of situation. Um, and they're still working, I mean, they're amazing. Okay, to my last point. Um, I think when Ada <laughs> started to do her work in 2012, one of the things that also why the term social theater became so popular is that theater people were first of all answering your question that they wanted to uh, not be activists. Uh, they still wanted to do theater and they also were scared to call it political because if you call it political theater, um, especially if you work in a state institution, you cannot do that. You just cannot do. So we do social theater, you know, we involve marginalized groups, we help them. Uh, so it's a bit of like patronizing kind of thing. But it is social, no politics involved. And when we work with uh, people with handy, uh, people with disabilities, uh, you know, we make a nice uh, theater piece, if they can find jobs or if they uh, as accessible roads, I mean, that's not our business, right? We are, we are theater makers. Um, and that's also some one of the things that was frustrating me for a lot of time. And after all of my like nomadic uh, travels, um, I came back to Russia in 2018, and I found out that the landscape changed. There's a new generation uh, came, and suddenly they started to want to call it political. And still, it is it gets a bit of a push from the mainstream uh, theater. 
practitioners, but they already cannot just ignore it because the movement becomes super big. So uh, it becomes suddenly there is a feminist performances. Of course, they were before as well, but suddenly now it is a thing, uh, and people don't uh, are not afraid to call themselves feminist uh, theater makers or use feminitives, which is also a big struggle now in Russia. A lot of left ideas suddenly, again in Russia, this scary communism, like a lot of people don't want to deal with left. I mean, we already lived for that. We don't want this lefty thing. But a new generation say, hey, but wait a second. There is, there is capitalism. You know, we still want some social security and you, you know, some of the things, let's talk about it. Um, talks about participation again um, and what does it mean and um, how we can be more involved in political processes, artists become activists. So that's the uh, last word. Just to give you a couple of examples, uh, also from uh, uh, my practice um, in 2018 when I came to Moscow to Merford Theater Center, uh, I found um, some people with whom I wanted to work together and they were younger than me, five and five, five and 10 years younger than me. So that was like a new generation of people who were not afraid to do a feminist performance <laughs> suddenly. And uh, suddenly the climate would be changed that this uh, big institution also supported us. And uh, an old feminist colleagues who came to see our performance, they said, wow, I mean, you are on a big stage in Moscow. Like 10 years ago, we couldn't expect that you were doing it on the streets and in the small corners. I mean, so something is changing. This performance uh, we did in an uh, all-women team uh, with a dot, transgender inclusive, uh, non-binary inclusive. Um, we uh, uh, did a, took a verbatim play from Scottish playwright Gary McNair, uh, a play that is called Locker Room Talk, which is documenting a sexist language. And we didn't stage it. We used our female bodies to uh, explore this text, to react on it, and to do uh, something from rap to reenactment for whatever different performative uh, things. To one of the scenes is a forum theater, so it's quite a mixed uh, um, mediums we use. And another performance also was done also at Merford Theater Center in Moscow, what's called uh, Carriers of Capitalism, Carriers Cavity of capitalism, this one in a tooth. That's why there's the golden tooth there. Uh, where we were talking about um, work conditions in theater for young artists, and exactly to, uh, going back to uh, Polish report, um, the debates that are becoming uh, more important in Russia is about hierarchies. How do you do uh, mainstream theater, which is also, you know, these social practices that are outside of theater, they need to come inside. We need to talk about how we create uh, collaborations are becoming more popular. Um, talking about money is a, is a cultural thing. It's really unpolite to talk about uh, money, especially for artists. Uh, so that's exactly what we do in this performance. We talk about money, how artists, uh, how much do they get, a freelance system, security system, how do we change the other industry, um, and this kind of talks, and I feel uh, that's becoming more and more in Russia at the moment, maybe because the political situation is getting <coughs> worse and worse. But there is a big push from the younger generation, uh, which I found really inspiring. And I think that's the end of my presentation. And any questions, I guess, we discussed today, but also for the digital audience, uh, you can write me and contact me. I would be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you so very much for that uh, vast and rich uh, presentation. I think last but not least uh, really gets a new meaning here. Um, because this was the last report of the day for today. So um, I would love to jump right into the discussion, but it's also with pleasure that I guess I'm saying bye to our digital um, members and partners and audience. Um, 
you will be joining George and Milena for the um, for the digital feedback. Hopefully, right now we'll open the session as soon as we're um, turning off the stream, which will be any moment soon. Um, but let me first say that we're then looking forward to um, seeing you uh, tomorrow, uh, either at 11:15 for the next stream that will be the keynote on Pukpak, our next. Um, big topic, the founding of the Permanent University Conference of Performing Arts in Context, that will be going tomorrow. Um, or before that, at 10 a.m., we're having the um, first uh, individually organized feedback loops. That's where delegates here are reporting back, getting back uh, in contact with their partners in the different countries. But if you're watching the stream now and, and you're, you're in the online discussions and you're feeling maybe you're not represented here, or maybe you do want to get in touch, feel free to dial into the same Zoom session that you've been dialing into for the last couple of days, and we'll see to establish the loop. So I guess this is bye for now for the digital audience. Thanks so much. And this means we would be cutting the stream. See you tomorrow. <laughs>